So thanks very much for turning up tonight. Um, the, the title of the presentation might be a tiny bit misleading. When I came up with the topic, um, I was hoping it would be an A to Z, but unfortunately I couldn't find um, an exercise for every letter of the alphabet. Um, and really there is so much out there in terms of information about exercise, but what I am going to try and do is just give you a snapshot. Some of the information will be perhaps reiterating um, on some of Joe's points, but um, some of the questions that came up in the last section, I'm hoping I will answer them and develop them a little bit more for you. So really the aim of this presentation is to try and prov provide an evidence-based overview of the benefit, or not, of different types of exercise across a range of health conditions. And in putting this talk together, I really tried to source um, the highest level of evidence, which is randomised controlled trials. That doesn't mean I'm going to get into detail of the studies, but just in terms of the sources of the information, um, they are from uh, tr trials. Now, having said that, not every randomised controlled trial is the same, and this is sometimes the problem when you're trying to evaluate. And um, Joe mentioned about the media, and one day you'll hear a result from a study, and then the next day you'll hear the result from another study, and they almost appear to contradict each other. And this is often because there's differences in the study design, and we always have to just take that into account when we're evaluating the evidence. So it's also important to say that lack of evidence doesn't mean lack of effect. So just because somebody hasn't done a study evaluating a particular type of exercise doesn't mean it's effective. And really exercise is, I suppose, behind the, the drug um, evaluation. So there's a lot more to be done in terms of um, research evidence for exercise. And exercise isn't new. So back even as far as Hippocrates, he identified that exercise and diet are important in um, managing health. And I just wanted to clarify um, just terminology. So physical activity, uh, what's the difference between it and exercise? Well, physical activity is any bodily movement that is produced by skeletal muscles that results in energy expenditure. And we usually we, me we can measure energy expenditure in things like calories and so on. So this can include your um, activity during work. So if you're in a very physical job, you're, you're expending energy. Um, maybe your domestic time. So somebody um, asked about you know, having the shower earlier on. And it could be things like hoovering, washing the windows. So any kind of domestic activity can be classified as energy expenditure if it's, if it's in t um, vigorous enough. And, and then you've got your leisure time. Now exercise is a little bit more planned and purposeful, so it's a, it's a form, it's like a sub type of physical activity. So usually people will undertake exercise because they want to get fit or they want to reap some health benefits from it. And uh, Joe alluded to this very nicely, um, about the, the, the physical activity pyramid. And we're all familiar with the food pyramid, uh, and this is really just an, an adaptation of that. And um, the, Irish char char the Irish Society of Chartered Physiotherapists every year run a Move for Health campaign, and this is a, a health promotion campaign which is designed to encourage people to go out and be active. And every year we focus on a particular health condition or a population. And in 2012, the focus was on cancers. And again, Joe made reference to the importance of exercise in both the prevention and uh, treatment of cancers, and, I and I'm going to come back to it again later. So this was developed with the Irish Cancer Society. Um, along with the Irish, um, the Irish Society of Chartered Physiotherapists. Now, the information isn't anything new. It's very well-established information. And again, it comes back to somebody's question earlier about how much we do. And this quantifies it very nicely. But when you put it into a pyramid, it's just easier to conceptualise it. So at the bottom of the pyramid, we have the things we should be doing most frequently. And every day, we should be active to some extent, even if it's mowing the lawn, taking the dog for a walk, getting off the bus one stop earlier, going up the stairs instead of the escalator, just finding opportunities to be active. Then we have the more structured types of exercise. So the most frequent exercise we should be doing is aerobic exercise. And I'm going to talk about the different types of exercise further on. But exercise, aerobic exercise should be taken um, five to seven days a week. And we should accumulate 30 to 60 minutes of exercise a day. So this means you, know, you can do it in blocks of even 10 minutes. So you could do 10 minutes in the morning. For example, you could walk to, to work in the morning. You could walk home from work in the evening. And that might be your 30 or 60 minutes and so on. Then we have the other types of exercise would be things like strength and flexibility, which should be done two or three times a week. And there are various ways of doing these. And again, I'm going to go into these in a bit more detail later. And then at the top of the pyramid is the things we should be minimizing, cutting down on. So long periods of sitting, watching TV, playing computer games on the internet. We really should be sitting for short periods, getting up and moving regularly. And that would be really the message that we would be trying to get across to people. 
So I'm going to show you just a couple of minutes of this YouTube clip. I really like this clip. It's actually nine minutes long. And um, if you want to just Google it yourselves later, it, it would be easy enough to find. Just put in 23 and a half hours, and I suspect you'll, you'll probably find it quite easily. And it's a really nice um, educational clip. So I'm just going to play you a couple of minutes of it. And welcome to this visual lecture I'm calling 23 and a half hours. So I have a big interest in preventive medicine, you know, which can mean a lot of things from, you know, cancer screening to eating more fiber to having a good social network. And I, I mean that in the old sense of the word, you know, weighing less, drinking less, smoking less, controlling your blood pressure, cholesterol, and so on and so forth. So all these things are incredibly important and I wouldn't want you to uh, minimize your efforts in any one category, but I, I want to know what comes first. What, what, what has the biggest impact? What has the biggest return on investment? What makes the biggest difference to your health? So I did my research and I, I found an answer, at least for me, and it's tricky because, you know, all these things are sort of overlapping. Uh, but I picked out this intervention and because of its breadth, uh, it worked for so many different health problems. And that's what I found so cool about it. So just to kind of walk you through a quick list. So this intervention uh, in patients with knee arthritis who receive one hour of treatment three times a week reduced their rates of pain and disability by 47%. In older patients, it reduced progression to dementia and Alzheimer's by uh, around 50%. For patients at high risk of diabetes and coupled with other lifestyle interventions, it reduced progression to frank diabetes by 58%. Postmenopausal woman who had four hours a week of the treatment had a 41% reduction in the risk of hip fracture. It reduced anxiety by 48% in a big meta-analysis. Patients suffering from depression, 30% were relieved uh, with low dose and that bumped to 47% as we uh, increased the dose. Um, following over 10,000 Harvard alumni for over 12 years, those that had the intervention had a 23% lower risk of death than those who didn't get the treatment. It's the number one treatment of fatigue and of course the kind of outcome of choice there, my favorite outcome is quality of life which is really all of the above and, and really about making your life better and this treatment has been shown over and over again to improve quality of life. So the question is, what's the, what's the medicine and, and what is 23 and a half hours? So the medicine was exercise, mostly walking, so not triathlons. And, and let me just put it a different way. I, I think what I'm um, asking you to do is if you think about your typical day, so there's 24 hours, and so you might spend most of your day, you know, this varies obviously, but uh, you know, couch surfing, sitting at work, obviously sleeping. And what um, the evidence that I'm going to show you kind of tells me is the best thing you can do for your health is to spend half an hour being active, maybe an hour, and that uh, if you can do that, you can realize all the benefits I described in the previous slides. So let's just take a quick walk through some of the literature. So Okay, so hopefully that's, um, you know, that maybe I could stop at this point as well, but I am going to go on and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the different types of exercise because that's where it's a little bit blurry and there's a lot of information out there and it's not always clear about what is the best type of exercise. Okay, so, you know, you can look that up and, and watch the other seven minutes and it, you know, continues to be quite entertaining. I quite like it. I think it's, it's very visual uh, and it's, it's, it's available, you know, free online. So, uh, Joe again alluded to this very nicely. This is a little bit blurry, but it's really just to show you the benefits of exercise in terms of, um, you know, effects on heart disease, obesity, um, joint problems and bone problems like osteoarthritis and osteoporosis. Its effects on things like muscle strength and flexibility. And in fact, in, the, in older people, you know, exercise can reduce risk of falls. It's, a, it's positive effects on pulmonary disease, so lung disease, diabetes, hypertension and stroke. In cancers, again, uh, Joe alluded to this very nicely. And this is definitely an emerging area of research, um, recognizing the importance of exercise in both prevention and treatment of certain cancers. And then mental health. So so again, you know, not just our own how we're feeling um, kind of in terms of our mood and depression and anxiety, but also our actual cognitive function. So it's been found to be effective in the management of things like dementia and Alzheimer's. So other things that are not on that list that I think are important to highlight to you is that exercise helps fatigue. And fatigue is, is quite a significant symptom associated with certain diseases, some of the autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, and some of the cancers. And this fatigue, it's not just ordinary tiredness. This is beyond ordinary tiredness, and it's something that rest did not always improve. 
And it's been found in certain studies um, in relation to breast and uh, prostate cancer that aerobic exercise reduced fatigue, whereas resistance training, so strength training, didn't. So definitely there's a, there's a positive reason to go out and do some aerobic exercise. Similarly, in relation to MS and rheumatoid arthritis, low impact aerobic exercise also reduced fatigue. So this is something really, it's important, really important to tell patients from, from our perspective, because um, the instinct is I'm tired, I've no energy, and I can't go out and exercise. But actually knowing that I, if, if I do go out, it'll make my symptoms better is a really important message to get across. Exercise helps pain. And again, this is another message that's really important from a physiotherapist's perspective, because most of the people who seek physiotherapy come because of pain. And they're afraid to exercise because they think they're going to make their pain worse. But in fact, in most of the musculoskeletal conditions that, that um, we would deal with, exercise helps pain. So there are some chronic pain conditions out there, such as fibromyalgia um, and chronic low back pain and arthritic conditions like osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis, which have all been shown to have a bent where exercise is a key part of their management. And again, the exercise is, I mean, the exercise a lot of the time doesn't really matter what, what the exercise is. Hydrotherapy or water exercise or aqua aerobics or simple swimming is, is a nice way to manage it, particularly if, if the joints don't like a lot of loading. It can be in things in, in a group setting, for example, in this picture, this is quite nice because it's, it's multitasking a little bit. So they're doing an exercise with, with free weight, so a little bit of strengthening work, but also by sitting on a balance ball, that's creating a little bit of an unstable surface, and that's helping their core stability, which I'm going to talk about later, and it's improving their balance. Um, and also just to be aware that Arthritis Ireland, which is a voluntary body, um, which gives a lot of information to the general public about arthritis in Ireland, one of their information leaflets is called um, it's Physical Activity and Arthritis, and it gives very good guidelines, and these are free online on the Arthritis Ireland website. Again, would be easy enough to Google it and you'll find it. And their theme, um, their message here is moving is the best medicine. So if we were just to think about the different types of exercise, I've touched on them very briefly. And again, this looks like a really busy slide, but I'll try and just, um, you know, not uh, complicate things too much. So we can think about the, the biggest, most important exercise is aerobic exercise. That's the one that we should be doing most frequently. And this involves using large movement, large muscle groups. Um, and it's really, a t the time um, factor here is important. So we're really talking about exercise that lasts for longer than a few minutes. So it could be 30 minutes, 60 minutes. It could go on to hours if somebody was doing, for example, a marathon. Not not saying that everyone has to go out and do marathons. And the reason why we do aerobic exercise is to improve the efficiency and the capacity of the cardiorespiratory system. So it can be things like walking, running, swimming, dance, hiking, whatever. Anaerobic exercise requires energy production systems that don't use ex um, oxygen. And this is a very specific type of exercise that perhaps you're going to see athletes using and, and elite athletes. So this is much shorter durations of exercise for two to three minutes. So that the best example of anaerobic exercise is watching uh, Usain Bolt running down the track in less than 10 seconds. It's a very short duration, very high intensity burst of energy. And of course, 99% of the population don't need to do the anaerobic exercise. Powerlifting is another example for people who do a lot of um, very heavy weightlifting. So then we're into strength and resistance training. And strength and resistance training doesn't necessarily mean you have to go into the gym um, and, and pump huge weights. You know, it can be used across all age spectrums. And this is about improving strength, power and endurance and size of skeletal muscles. And when we think about resi resistance training, it can be simple things like free weights as shown here. It can be resistive bands, and I'm going to show you a picture of that later. Or something like a circuit uh, where you move around different stations and there's, you're, you can work different parts of the body. But it doesn't have to be huge amounts of resistance that you're using. Um, and again, I'll, I'll give examples of where this has been shown to be effective in certain health conditions. And finally, we have flexibility. And really, for any type of exercise, it's important that we maintain our flexibility. And this is our joint range of motion. And to, um, to make sure that we get the best benefits from flexibility, we should be holding stretches for 30 seconds. So this is part of a kind of a warm up and a cool down for any exercise that we would incorporate some flexibility, but perhaps should be, you know, can be done, um, you know, two or three times a week in a more structured way. So things like yoga, for example, is a very good way of getting your flexibility exercise in. Now there is a new kid on the block in terms of exercise and this has uh, been termed neuromotor exercise or functional fitness training. 
And this is also recommended along with kind of strength training and flexibility training for um, maybe two to three days a week. And in a way, it's replacing traditional strength training. And it's, it's using the concept of motor control. And this is a very um, common terminology that we would use in relation to people who are having rehab after stroke. We're trying to improve. It's not just about strength. It's about improving the, for example, the pathways that the neural pathways or the nerve pathways from our brain to our muscles and back. So people often talk about muscle memory. The more you do something, the more it becomes, um, you know, it's practiced and it becomes more automatic and it becomes, you know, more, more natural for you. And that's the, probably the underlying principle of motor control. We're trying to improve our muscle memory. And this can translate into, therefore, improvements in balance, agility, coordination. Um, and things like Tai Chi and yoga perhaps fit nicely into this into this category. So, so again, because it's a fairly new type of exercise, there isn't as much um, evidence and it's not as clear about the dose amount as we have for strength training and aerobic fitness, but it does, um, there is some research out there that shows, for example, in, in older people, it can improve balance and fear of falling which is a very important um, you know, outcome to consider. The, 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 the high levels of falling in, in older adults has huge health consequences. Um, in a, I suppose it originally came from a sporting context and is, is now kind of commonly used in um, the rehab of the ACL injuries that every other GA player seems to be getting at the moment and sprained ankle um, rehab as well. So you know, it, it, doesn't, it can cross all types of um, uh, health conditions. And I suppose a very good example of this is something that uh, a lot of people have at home is the Wii. So you're all familiar with the Wii and there's a Wii balance board which is called Wii Fit. Um, so if people you know, use this at home, they're in fact doing neuromotor training. So this is an example where somebody has got the visual um, feedback from the Wii screen and they're doing you know, basically yoga poses or balance training and some of them are a bit more dynamic where you're trying to play football or ski down a slope. And that's a really good form of, okay, it's fun, but actually it's a really good form of exercise or therapy. Um, it, it, you don't need wee balance boards, you can just use it, do it very simply yourself and you know there's a lot of um, kind of ways we can increase the complexity of the balance training um, like standing on one leg, closing your eyes, standing on unstable surfaces and so on. And then some of the exercises are, as we said, they're functional exercises. So something simple like squat exercises um, are very beneficial because first of all, they're targeting loads of muscle groups. So the amount of control that a person needs around their abdomen, into their legs, into their bum muscles, their knee muscles and so on. Um, plus they're getting flexibility work by doing this exercise. And this is functional. This is, you know, this mimics getting in and out of a chair. So we can, again, this doesn't have to be uh, a young person doing this. This can be, uh, can be used in any age group. So coming back to the, um, the, the, the traditional types of exercise, you know, I, I don't, won't spend too much time on this because Joe has covered this quite nicely already, but this is the idea of what, how aerobic exercise reduces the risk. So all the things that he mentioned are up here. Diabetes, your cardiovascular diseases, your strokes, um, depression and dementia, breast cancer and colon cancer. And this line just shows how um, you know, all these are hovering around the same area. So they're all exercises having the same effect on all of these. And also there is a kind of a dose response effect. So this was somebody asked this earlier about, you know, about how much we should do and does it have an impact? Well, it does because the more we do to a certain point, the, base, the greater the benefit. So thinking of aerobic exercise and you know, what type is best. So we have two types, broadly speaking. We have the continuous type of exercise is where you just go out and exercise without rest. So it could be your 30 minute walk. It could be your you know, 30 minute an hour cycle. It could be your hike up into the woods, up into the mountains. Um, it could be swimming for 30 to 45 minutes, but you're not really stopping as such. You might take short little breaks, but it's, you know, it's generally your continuous. Um, the other type is, somebody asked about this earlier, about the high intensity training. And this is one example of high intensity training where it's at a higher level than your continuous training, but it's interval based. In other words, you do a very high concentrated period of exercise and then you recover and then you do another high concentrated period. And this, um, this just shows it here that you'd have your very high high level, so if you were to kind of score the effort up here, it would be out of 10, probably 8 or 9 out of 10, and your heart rate would be way up there, and then you allow recovery, you come back down, and then you repeat it, and you do this, you know, for a number of repetitions. And again, this has traditionally been used by athletes, but I'm going to mention how this is actually being used now in certain health conditions as well as an alternative to continuous. Um, it is important to say it hurts, and the reason why it hurts is because you're building up lactic acid in your muscles, and that's not a nice feeling if you if you're, get that feeling. So, you know, again, I wouldn't recommend people go out and start doing interval training straight away. They really have to work from a base of having a continuous aerobic level, but it is another type of exercise you might just hear people talking about. 
And, you know, in the guidelines, we, we advise people to go out and do moderate or vigorous exercise. So how do we define it? Because that's going to be quite personal to people. So one way is using a thing called a Borg scale. And again, to get the various levels here, you can you know, Google this, it's all, it's all there. And this is a, a one to 10 scale of perceived exertion. So basically um, you decide, you know, if it's moderate, you're gonna be working on a scale of three to four to five out of 10 perhaps. So you're going somewhere from either moderate to somewhat hard or sort of hard to hard. And that would be classified as your kind of moderate exercise. If you were working to a vigorous level, you'd be up at the really hard seven to eight. One is really easy and 10 would be the maximal, like just like I was doing a race and I was flat out for, for the whole time. And this has been shown to validate or to correlate very well with an actual trying to measure um, effort in other scientific ways like heart rate and oxygen consumption. So it is a, a really good way to try and decide how hard I need to work. And it's all about your perceived exertion. So sometimes people also talk about the talk test. You know, in other words, I should be able to talk if it's not, if it's moderate, I should be able to continue conversation conversation, um, you know, while I'm exercising, whereas vigorous, probably not. Other ways you can try to monitor and decide how, how, how hard you're working would be using heart rate monitoring. So the simple way would be just to measure your heart rate before and after the exercise. The problem is you don't quite know what's going on during the exercise. It's not really feasible to walk around and try to count at the same time. So you usually do it afterwards. Um, and other people use things like heart rate monitors. So heart rate monitors just involve wearing a belt around the, around the heart and then the information is read off a watch. And this is obviously it can be done during the exercise. So you have a record of how much your heart rate is, is, is um, exerting itself and what it's at during the exercise. And why is this information useful? Well, we have this thing called the target heart rate. And the target heart rate is a, it's a very crude, um, I suppose, equation, but it is, it is a start. Um, but it's defined as 220 minus your age. And then you decide how much of that target heart rate you want to work at. So for example, if you just want to work in, in an aerobic way, you're probably going to work at 75 to 85% of your target heart rate. If you were you know, an athlete and you had to really push um, up to very high intensity, you might be for at, some, at times, not all the time, working from 85 to 100% of your heart rate. If you just want to do, keep it down low and you're cooling, cooling down or warming up, you might be down around 50% of your target heart rate. So these zones are really helpful to try and decide how much I can do. So this is like an intensity measure. So I, I really should just mention the role of the physiotherapist here because, um, you know, uh, Joe mentioned this as well. We really should think about how exercise is like medicine. It's like medication. There's a few differences though. First of all, medication is much more regulated than exercise. Anyone can just go out and do exercise and really are not given, it may not have any guidance about the dose or the intensity and so on. Um, and we really have to think about that. It is a little bit, you know, scientific about it. It's not just a matter of going out and exercising. We really should try and apply a little bit of science to it. Um, and we have to think about, as physiotherapists, we play a key role in exercise um, prescription and supervision. And as you see, when I talk to some of the exercise types, you know, there's so much out there um, that people often do need guidance. And, you know, uh, you know, again, Joe made reference to this very nicely about the type and the dosage, the frequency and the intensity and how you can need to be supervised and often progressed through those, particularly if, if it's for a particular health condition that you're receiving um, exercise therapy. And really, that's what we call it in physio. We call it a therapy because that, that's what it is from our perspective. So we're left with a really, a, a, you know, quite um, a staggering amount of types of exercise out there. I mean, I probably could have gone from A to Z, and I was thinking Z would have been Zumba, and A could have been Aqua Aerobics, and I probably would have found all the other letters of the alphabet in between, and there would have been an exercise for that. Um, I did try to do that, but it was becoming a little bit obscure. So, but there are lots of choices out there. So whether it be running, walking, Aqua Aerobics, um, I felt I had to put this in because it was in the title. This is aqua jogging. And aqua jogging is often used, um, for example, when people have something like a stress fracture and they want to, they're not allowed to run or they're not allowed to put weight. So they'll often go into a pool and they'll, they'll basically run in the pool because it's, all, it's taking weight off the, the legs. So that's what aqua jogging in, in, ca in case that's why you came to the talk, just to find out what it was. Um, also things like soccer, and again, I'm not really talking about children here, but we shouldn't forget about uh, you know, kids and getting kids involved in exercise early, because exercise is a behavior, and the behaviors that we learn in childhood carry through to adulthood. So if kids are used to exercising, it'll just carry through, and this is a really important um, thing to consider you know, if you have children. 
uh, going out on your bike, step aerobics, and these are all examples of aerobic type of exercise, playing tennis, some kind of racket sport. Then we get into the other ones like the weightlifting, yogas, and um, you know, I'm going to mention this, this idea of the core stability. So this is only, I mean, I didn't have enough room on the slide really to put in all the other types of exercise that we can do. So my first thing to probably highlight is, or my first question is, does it matter what type of exercise we do? Because a lot of the time it doesn't. Just get out there and, and do something aerobically, go walking, go swimming. But for certain conditions, it does actually matter. And Joe mentioned bone health earlier, and our peak bone health production is in our 20s and 30s. And it's been found that, you know, that activities that where we're loading our bones, so, you know, for example, jumping sports, maybe what they call odd impact loading, like soccer, racket games, generally we tend to produce higher bone mineral density. Even walking will produce higher bone mineral density than non-impact sports. So, for example, swimming and cycling do not improve bone health. So if you have bone health issues or there's a history of bone health issues in, in your family or you're perhaps, you know, again, the, the greatest group at risk of um, bone density issues are postmenopausal women. So perhaps maybe swimming wouldn't be the best thing. Perhaps getting into the pool and walking in the pool or doing some walking uh, you know, on land as well would be important. And also strength training has been found to be very important and is used quite a lot in the management of um, osteoporosis. Uh, there's another group of conditions where, again, aerobic exercise has been found to be very important. And this is in the areas of cardiac and pulmonary rehabilitation. So this is people who've had cardiac events, for example, heart attacks or heart surgery. And there's a very structured rehab exercise program they go through afterwards. Similarly, for people with chronic lung disease, such as chronic bronchitis or asthma, um, they often have, um, a, again, a very structured program of exercise called pulmonary rehabilitation. Now, these are usually done in a supervised environment, perhaps in a hospital environment with health professionals, for example, physiotherapists, nurses, doctors, and there's usually a multidisciplinary team around. But it has been found that aerobic endurance training, usually in the form of a circuit class, so they move to different circuits and they do this program for a certain period of time, a couple of times a week, um, has been shown to be very effective in recovery and prevention of further events and managing their disease. And as the, um, the, the YouTube doctor, Mike Evans, talked about the quality of life, which is really the, probably the most important outcome that we, can, we could consider. So some other things about cardiac rehab specifically has been shown that if you do resistance training as well as the aerobic training, um, again, no more than three days a week, because that's the guideline, it's been found to show an added benefit. So here's a very simple example of um, you know, people in a cardiac rehab environment using very, very you know, they don't have to be big weights, just light hand weights, doing some arm, arm exercise, and that will have an effect in terms of their recovery. Similarly, in pulmonary rehab, um, the, this is where I, I was going to come back to talk about interval training. So it's been found that interval training is an alternative for more severe breathlessness. Now, this is not necessarily the high intensity interval training I talked about with the athletic population. This would be lower level, but what it does do is allows recovery between exercise. So when your heart rate is brought up and perhaps you're getting a little bit short of breath, people with pulmonary disease would struggle with that. So they would need longer recovery times. So it's a form of interval training, but it wouldn't be the high, high high intensity we would see in perhaps um, in the elite athlete. And similarly, resistance training, adding to, to that um, aerobic exercise will also have a benefit. So there are the conditions where there's a very clear um, you know, benefit of which type of exercise works. And you know, there's probably lots more, but you know, again, time prevents me from going into all of them, but just to give you a snapshot. So going back to the different types of exercise, so that's aerobic exercise and the different types. I'm going to move on now to talk about strength training as, as an exercise and what it does. So traditionally, we think of strengthening, we use this principle of progressive resisted exercise, or PRE. And this uses the principle of you have a small number of repetitions until the muscle fatigues. Um, but in between that, you have rest or recovery of approximately two to three minutes, and you increase that resistance as the muscle gets stronger, you have to challenge it. So that's why it's called progressive resisted. And there are very, very clear guidelines. Um, Joe mentioned the American College of Sports Medicine, and they really are an excellent source of guidelines around any type of exercise, and they're constantly updated, and they've got exercises for people without disease, and then they have exercises for people with specific diseases. Um, so this, you know, they provide a lot of detail about how much exercise one should do. Now, of course, I would, I would recommend if you were going to do, start doing resisted exercise or strength training, you get advice from um, a health professional or if it's in a gym environment, you get advice from the gym instructor. Really don't go off and just decide yourself to start doing it because technique is always very important as well. So examples <coughs> include, you know, your barbell lifting um, and it's always is the man, isn't it, in the, you know, 
with no top on and he looks pretty good and we all want to be like him but you know that, that may not always happen but there are other uh, ways we can do resistance training for example these are the resistive bands and free weights and again I put in this picture deliberately because it doesn't have to be the young um, the young man doing the heavy weight training um, for, to do strength training and um, I suppose an alternative to traditional strength training, which has really taken off in the last 10 or 15 years, is um, core stability training. And this is like a buzzword at the moment. Everyone talks about, are you doing your core training? And people say, well, what, what does this actually mean? So I'm going to try and explain it a little bit. So um, within the, and this is really, um, a lot of this has come from people with, with low back pain. And it's become a really important treatment for the management of low back pain. So the inner core includes the, um, the deep spinal and abdominal muscles. So these are, we have layers of muscles and these are the deepest muscles. They're closest to the spine. And um, they also include the muscles of the pelvic floor and the diaphragm. So we have this um, picture here of the, the back muscles, the deep layer of back muscles attaching right into the spine. We have this deep layer of um, abdominal muscles and the most important muscle here that people would concentrate on is called transversus abdominis. And then we have our pelvic floor muscles here and up here at the top we have our diaphragm and these are creating this kind of core and it's really just helping to support the spine and support our, our internal organs also. And we need this um, trunk stability for everyday movements. For example, if I'm just to even reach up um, my hand straight away, my muscles in my abdominal area have to activate to, to allow me to do that, to keep good stability in my back. And this, that's just even by doing that or by lifting my leg, these muscles are, are starting to kick in. So if you think of all the activities we have to do, we don't go around rigidly all the time. We're constantly moving um, into various positions. So we need these muscles. Uh, and this is where this core stability training becomes quite important. And it's an alternative to traditional strength training for certain certain conditions and there's very good evidence for its use again really under the direction of a physiotherapist because it's quite specific type of exercise um, for the management of low back pain. So um, I'll just run very quickly through the principle just to give you a flavour of it because I think it's a lot of things, a lot of um, people are heard of it but maybe not quite sure what it's about. So there's some basic principles here. We start in a fairly neutral spine or supported position. So here this person is lying down, knees are bent and he's learning to palpate or feel for his transversus abdominis and what he's trying to do there is isolate it and that's a very difficult exercise. It actually is quite a cognitive exercise in terms of you have to think about the exercise and you know a lot of visual imagery needs to be used here to try and isolate muscles um, and at the same time he has to learn how to control do nice controlled breathing so he's not holding his breath so using the all the muscles of the core together and this is low effort this is 20 to 30 percent effort so it's very different to the person that you see doing the 100 sit-ups and you know huffing and puffing and making you know lots of sweat dripping and so on it's very low effort but you're holding time and you're doing lots of repetitions and then you progress into more unsupported positions. So in this uh, position here, straight away, you know, it's going to be harder because he's got less body support and also he's starting to lift an arm and lift a leg. So this is how we can progress this type of exercise. And finally, we can start to progress into functional activities. So for example, if it was used, being used for somebody with, in a sporting context, they might use it, for example, the GAA player. This would fit very nicely for somebody, um, you know, either rugby or GAA, that they would start to learn how to activate these muscles and start to increase the challenge and, and the task. So one example of core stability training is Pilates. And I'm sure some of you here in the audience have done Pilates or you know, heard of Pilates. And by coincidence, I suppose, Pilates has actually been around for a long, long time. It was developed in the early 20th century and um, by Joseph Pilates. And this was really a, a way of him trying to manage um, his, he was a, a, a training ballet dancers. And we, you know, we all know how beautifully pa ballet dancers move and how they've got really good strength for the types of um, postures and movements that they have to do. So um, I suppose it's been around for a long time, but as the research for um, the core stability started to come into play, people started to realize actually there's a lot of commonality here between Pilates and core stability. So now a lot of the Pilates ac exercises are being modified for use for, for people with low back pain. So, um, you know, research has shown that it does provide pain relief if rather than doing nothing. It may not necessarily be any better than any other type of exercise, but it is an option. So if, if Pilates is something you like and you tend to be vulnerable for low back pain, again, you probably do need to uh, go to somebody, a Pilates instructor and somebody who, who does take people who have back pain. Because some Pilates classes may, may not want, may, may just um, do the classes at a very high level. So we have different levels of Pilates as well. It also has been shown to improve balance and reduce risk of falls in, in older women. 
Um, and it's often used for people uh, postnatally and in the management of stress incontinence. This really um, requires a bit more research to try and validate its use. So some of the other maybe more alternative type of exercises that are becoming more mainstream now in the management of health conditions, we have Tai Chi. And Tai Chi is a martial arts uh, originated from China. It's a mind-body intervention and it involves, it's a weight-bearing exercise, usually standing, and it involves controlled sequential movements, pretty low to moderate intensity. So the types of um, conditions it has been shown to be effective in is osteoarthritis, and it's been found it improves strength, it improves coordination and balance, and this transfers into an improvement in function, which is, again, the bottom line for patients. That's what they want, to be able to, want to, be able to do their everyday activities. Chronic low back pains, I've already mentioned Pilates and core stability help low back pain. Here's another one, an alternative. So um, it, it helps pain and physical function. And again, you know, there's a lot of research going on into um, trying to reduce risk of falls in older adults. So it improves balance and risk of falling in older adults. Yoga, again, is another complementary therapy that is becoming quite mainstream in the management of health conditions. And this integrates physical postures, breath control and med meditation. And Again, you'd be familiar with some of, the, some of the yoga poses, for example. And this has been found to be a useful adjunct to medications in mild to moderate depressive disorders. So again, you wouldn't, it wouldn't replace medications. It would be done used in combination with them. And it's also been found to be useful in people who are recovering from breast cancer. So this is just to show you, the, this is only a small amount of the evidence. Um, and you know, as in another 10 or 20 years, I think we'll have more and more evidence for some of these exercises in, in, a, in a range of health conditions. Another one you may have heard of, and again, sometimes if you're in gyms and things, you see these machines in the corner and you see somebody standing on it and you hear a vibrating noise, you think, what is that person doing? And they're on a whole, a whole body vibration platform. And this is um, this, have you ever seen this in action? And this is a, a platform where there's an oscillation created from the platform and the person can stand on it. And, and what it does is produces uh, changes in muscle length and it kind of activates muscle reflexes. Now, I've, I've highlighted here the word preliminary because you know, these are often very small studies. The evidence isn't hugely strong at the moment, but it's a start and we do need a bit more evidence to validate um, its effect. But it has been shown to, to be of some benefit in the management of osteoporosis falls prevention in the elderly, multiple sclerosis, and a leg muscle performance is a little bit generic, but really just means it can improve muscle strength. It uh, may not have been specific to a particular condition. So, you know, we have all these exercises, and I hope by now you realize there's lots of, uh, lots of, things, lots of things we can do that can help a number of health conditions. And as I said, for some um, conditions, it's very clear what exercise we should be doing. For others, it, it's not that clear and, and probably doesn't matter. Any exercise is better than none. And if you think about the concept of aerobic versus strength training versus flexibility training, you know, that's where you can try to decide what I need to be doing. But perhaps I should just mention the risks, because that's the big question people want, want to know. And uh, you know, this came up in the first talk about, well, about the risk of um, you know, heart attack or myocardial infarction. And really, the risk is very low. And it's more likely to occur in people who are sedentary and then go out and are unaccustomed to physical activity. So for example, Joe said, you don't go out and start to run a marathon straight away. You, know, you, you start to you pace it, and you do you know, small amounts, and you build up gradually. Um, often these pe people, the risks are greater if you have other medical conditions, um, but the risk decreases the more exercise you do. The other one, again, Joan nicely referred to this, is osteoarthritis. And any studies that have looked at osteoarthritis, it's, it's really the people at the higher level of activity, the elite athletes that are a bit more vulnerable. So, for example, the professional footballers, but we can understand why. They have a higher risk of developing osteoarthritis of the knee. Um, Ex-elite athletes have a higher risk of developing osteoarthritis, but that's just because of pure, that's much, much higher levels of intensity. But as, as Joe mentioned, and, and exactly the same point I want to make, in fact, the most significant rest factor is increased body weight. And generally, people have increased body weight because they don't exercise. So therefore, you know, go out and exercise, you lower your body weight, and you lower your risk of osteoarthritis. The most common type of um, adverse event, and probably the one that physiotherapists see most of, is injury. And these can be you know, very trivial injuries and, and usually can be managed very successfully if the person seeks treatment early and um, recognises you know, not to kind of um, overdo it and rest and recover and so on. But musculoskeletal injury is usually more associated with higher intensity exercise. So going for your walk and um, progressing into light jogging, brisk walking is unlikely to cause injury unless you just happen to trip over something and fall, perhaps then, or fall in the ice and fall in the snow or whatever. But usually it's very much kind of based on higher intensity and it might relate 
to the type of exercise. So for example, the person who runs seven days a week perhaps is more vulnerable for certain injuries than somebody who just walks three or four days a week at a lower level of intensity. And competitive sport, but that's because it's just continuous high level of activity. The types of injuries that are most common are things like ankle sprains, um, stress fractures. So these again would be very much overuse injuries from repetitive exercise. Usually running is probably the most vulnerable for, for stress fractures. Um, and this is you know, people training for high intensity events like marathons and beyond. And then um, something called iliotibial band syndrome, which again is very specific to runners. So these, you know, musculoskeletal injury is okay, it's common, but it's, you know, in most of the population, it's not really a huge, um, a huge problem. And how do we reduce the risk? Well, first of all, try to do an adequate warm up and cool down, incorporate stretching into that cool down and warm up. And really, uh, it's all about progression in volume and intensity. And a good rule of thumb if you're undertaking aerobic exercise and you're thinking about progressing is by increasing by 10%. So for example, if you start off and you're walking 20 minutes, then you could progress up to add another 10% uh, to be two minutes. So I'm gonna do 22 minutes um, the next time and gradually progressing it. So your warm up and cool down just has the benefit of just getting the blood flowing to the muscles, getting the heart rate raised in the beginning, and then at the cool down you're just bringing your heart rate down and you're starting to stretch out the muscles. So um, again, thinking about the benefits and the risks. Well, really, I hope it's quite clear that the benefits really do outweigh the, the risks. And going back to this slide, which I put up at the beginning, when we think about all the health benefits, you know, the risks are few and far between. So finally, I just want to really just talk about what exercise is best for you, because chances are that if you're here today, it's because you want to do exercise or you want to know more about exercise and you're thinking of undertaking exercise. So first of all, I would say any exercise is better than none. And there is something for everybody. Choice is individual. There's a whole range of exercise out there and you just have to find something that suits you. Perhaps you might consider the age you're at, your current activity level. So if you're starting from zero, you know, you, there, there's, um, you know, starting with just simple walking. There is a program that a lot of people seem to buy into is the f from the couch to 5K or from the couch to 10K. And that's a really nice way of starting from a very low level and progressing up to, to perhaps the point of doing some kind of a distance like a 5 or 10K. It doesn't mean you're going out and doing a race, but you're building up progressively. And that's a very nice model to use. Um, just consider the activity levels guidance. So for example, aerobic exercise five days a week, strength training three days a week, flexibility three days a week. So it could be something simple like I'm gonna walk home, I'm gonna walk home from work um, maybe you know, a few days a week. I'm going to swim uh, one day a week. I'm going to take up a yoga class. You know, it doesn't have to be three days a week. Uh, sometimes your strength training can com come about just by doing um, you know, it, it, certain types of aerobic exercise as well. Uh, you, know, you can take up, you could do alternative types of exercise. And really, I, I think there's a value in the idea of variety and cross training. So you, know, you might decide I'll swim one day a week and I'll walk two days a week um, and so on. Mix it up because first of all, you're challenging different muscle groups. Um, you're less likely to get injury if you mix it up a little bit. And um, I suppose ultimately you need to do what you enjoy. So also consider exercising on your own or in a group. And Joe gave you that website address, which is really, really useful. And there are, this, this, there are meetup groups in Dublin um, that people can, for example, if you're interested in walking, they, they do a group of people with something in common can go out and walk or go hiking or go running in the Phoenix Park or whatever. So there's no end of opportunities to exercise in a group if that's what you feel is, is beneficial. And there is the benefit of exercising in a group because it keeps you motivated. Consider your lifestyle, consider, you know, you're trying to fit it around your job, your children, other things you do, and everyone is busy. So it could be something simple like getting off the bus a stop earlier, walking upstairs when you have opportunities, um, you know, cycling into work, uh, using the bike, the Dublin bike scheme, and uh, maybe at lunchtime you might have 20 minutes where you can do a walk around a park and so on. I think the hardest part is getting started. And really, I, I believe just, I've been exercising for years and I just think it's all about routine and it's all about just getting into that routine and staying in it. And, you know, sometimes the guilt of not doing it every day is, is probably the greatest motivator for me. Um, you know, this is January now and what I'm noticing in the, uh, in, I'm in a gym and I notice it's packed to the gills in the month of January, but I can predict because every other year it happens, February will just be back to the regular, regular people. So really it's all about getting started, but also staying motivated. And, you know, that's, that is the challenge, but it's really important to try and fit it into something that suits you, enjoy it, and, you know, don't see it as a challenge and don't see it as uh, something that you dread doing. You really have to enjoy it. You want to go out and do it and you want to feel better. And remember that little adrenaline buzz you do get at the end of an exercise session. 
Uh, one thing to consider, and Joe mentioned this, the idea of the screening questionnaires, and just to make reference to one which is quite useful, it's called the PARQ. And this is the Physical Activity Readiness Questionnaire. Again, this is online, you could find it online. It's a self-screening questionnaire. There are seven questions um, which really ask you about things such as, do you get faint or dizzy? Do you get chest pain? Do you get joint pain when you do certain things? And if you answer yes to any of those, really the advice is you need to talk to your doctor before undertaking exercise. And if in any doubt about your, you know, medical conditions you have, you need to seek advice. So, in summary then, exercise or physical activity, it's a viable and, as Joe mentioned, it's really inexpensive compared to um, other health treatments. And it is a, it is a therapy and it is a health uh, a, a type of medicine. And we can use it to combat so many serious diseases. And we just consider the other effects, effects on pain, effects on physical function, effects on mood, effects on fatigue and overall quality of life. So this really can translate into benefits across a whole range of conditions. And I've only really touched on a few and given you a little snap shot here, but across the areas of cardiorespiratory disease, musculoskeletal disease and neurological conditions. And there are clear benefits for certain types of exercise in certain diseases. In other areas, there's no clear consensus about what exercise works. But one thing for sure, exercise is better than no exercise. And if you really take away from today, the, the one message I would give it would be 30 to 60 minutes a day suffices. Five days a week, up to seven days a week, but it can be cumulative. It doesn't have to be all in one go. Just in terms of the resources I used for this talk, um, I used the Cochrane Library, which is an international database of randomized controlled trials, and I used the Physiotherapy Evidence Database. And this, um, you know, this, this website actually provides um, consumer summaries or layman summaries about research evidence for certain conditions and certain therapies, for physiotherapy therapies. So I don't, I don't think there's any reason why we can't all be like this woman. I think anything is possible. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'll take any questions. I think it's really important that we can give a message to the public how they can manage their own health and you know the whole variety of topics here really target certain health conditions and I think if, a lot of how people manage conditions is education and the topic I spoke about tonight is exercise it's just such a simple thing to go out and do but yet can be quite complex in terms of um, how we go about exercise and giving people the information so that they can take uh, responsibility for their own health is really important and that's a key principle across so many of the chronic diseases the idea of self management so once people are given the information they can then go off and, and manage themselves and that is cheaper for the healthcare system as well. It is a topic I'm interested in. There was two excellent speakers, uh, two highly qualified speakers, and it's rare that you'd get a lecture series that's free that you can come to as a member of the public and have such good quality speakers. It was um, the topic this evening was sport and exercise and how you can in, um, get that into your lifestyle and why? Why would you want to get that into your lifestyle? And I learned great things this evening. I learned that um, it can reduce um, loads of um, long-term illnesses and can have great benefits uh, for, for my health, my long-term health, and for my health on a day-to-day -day basis. I would. The lectures were very easy to listen to, um, very interesting, um, but very factually correct. Um, and so, you know, better than being on the internet, you know that you can come here and you can get really good quality information that's thoroughly researched and well thought out.